Okay, so I decided not to and just go ahead as I had planned, and the big advantage, of course, here, this is only a 20-minute talk. <laughs> so, um, we heard that uh, one thing that mathematicians done since age, do and since ancient days is to compute, and uh, computational recipes are algorithms. And so let me start out by uh, three such computational recipes that are known, or as mathematicians like to say, well-known, to uh, mathematicians and uh, actually some non-mathematicians as well. So the first one goes back to uh, the ancient Greeks, the Euclidean algorithm is a method for computing the greatest common divisor of, uh, in the first example, uh, three numbers. So the input uh, would be 60, 99, and 117, and out comes, so to feed this into the algorithm, and out comes the output three, which is the greatest common divisor. Uh, the same method uh, applies verbatim to uh, expressions uh, involving x like this instead of numbers, polynomials in, in one variable. So these creatures are called polynomials. So the greatest common divisor of the, uh, this first polynomial, x to the 8 minus 5 x to the 6, blah, blah. And the second one is x squared minus 1. And one way to think about it is that this algorithm uh, checks whether these two equations uh, have a common 0 x. And, and the answer is yes, indeed, they do plus one and minus one are the common zeros. So then uh, Gauss was mentioned, and uh, one thing that uh, Gauss did was look at uh, equations in more than one variable, linear equations, and uh, this is my second algorithm, Gaussian elimination solves linear systems of equations. So here is an, an example. Uh, this would be the input of this method. So uh, three equations of the form x plus y plus z equals 6, and two more. And then you feed this into the machine, and out comes the answer x is 1, y is 2, z is 3. So the first algorithm goes back uh, more than 2,000 years. Second algorithm goes back uh, more than 200 years. And the third algorithm on my list is one that goes back about 60 years due to Danzig and Kondorovich. That's called the simplex algorithm. And there, the problem also de deals with uh, linear expressions in, in several variables. And the problem is called linear programming. It plays an enormous role in uh, business applications of, of various sorts. Um, and here's a typical input to a linear programming problem, and here's a, a typical output. Uh, the only thing that, that I'd like you to notice is that the, the numbers are not integers in the solution. 1.6 would, would be a, uh, one of these uh, solutions here. So linear programming plays a big role, for instance, in the airline flight crew scheduling. Um, a student of my first PhD student who uh, worked in this area is now consulting for the oil industry in, in Texas. Uh, using the methods I'll describe in three minutes. So my assumption for this talk was that the audience, that the people in the audience know at least one of those, know and appreciate at least one of those three. So I assume that you know one of those three, but not necessarily the two others. Another thing that we mathematicians like to do is to, to generalize. So once we know how to do something, we would like to do it more general. And the question here that arises, if we have such uh, three nice algorithms, computational methods, wouldn't it be nice if these three algorithms had a common generalization? If there was one sort of mega method that uh, would, uh, in a special case, give us Euclidean algorithm, Gaussian elimination, and the simplex method. They do. That's the topic of this talk. So Grubner bases are a, a common generalization. Um, I said my assumption was that you uh, should know one of those three. If you do know the Euclidean algorithm, 
So that's uh, the GCD for polynomials in one variable. Then you can think about Gerbner bases as a kind of a GCD for polynomials in more than one variable. If Gaussian elimination is what you know, um, linear equations in, in many variables, then you can think about Gerbner bases as a kind of Gaussian elimination for nonlinear equations. And if the simplex algorithm is what you know, whereby you reach the optimal solution by applying uh, steps one at a time, then indeed Gerbner bases can be also viewed as generalizing uh, the simplex algorithm to a situation where the optimal solution has integer coordinates, not fractional numbers like 1.6 and 1.8. Let me uh, illustrate this with a, with a concrete problem. So this is uh, why don't we leave this take this down? So the question I like to uh, answer as an illustration, which method should we use to replace the coins in our wallet? with the fewest coins of the same value. It's a problem that uh, you may know. You have a whole bunch of coins, say, it's worth 67 cents in your wallet. And ideally, you would like to carry fewer coins around. So what should you do? Uh, what kind of method should you use um, that would work for any amount of coins? So first of all, uh, a mathematician would uh, write this English sentence in, in the following form. So what's in the green box is uh, perfectly identical to uh, the black English sentence, where uh, capital P stands for the number of pennies, capital N the number of nickels, capital D for the number of dimes, and capital Q for the number of quarters in your wallet. So how should we do it? Well, the answer is trade coins one at a time until you have fewer coins and fewer coins and fewer coins and fewer coins. And the trading rules, the exchange rules, there are four of them, and they form the Gropner basis of this problem. So the Gropner basis consists of four tiny rules that you can apply to the coins in your wallet. Um, and at each step, you reduce the number of coins that you have. So for instance, this p to the fifth minus n should be read as, you're allowed to trade in five pennies for a nickel. This says you can trade two nickels for a dime. This is more complicated. This says you can take two dimes and a nickel and trade it in for a quarter. And the fourth rule is uh, you could take three dimes and replace it by a nickel and a quarter. And then uh, the property that these four exchange rules form a Gerbner basis means that no matter what collection of coins you have in your wallet, uh, successively applying any of these rules will give you the optimal solution. So here's an example. So for instance, if your wallet currently contains four dimes, four nickels, and seven pennies, um, that should make 67, then uh, we would represent the current state of affairs, your current portfolio, would be uh, p to the 4, n to the 4, p to the 7. So we'd like to derive a better portfolio. And uh, we apply the first rule. So we, out of the 7 pennies, we trade in 5 for a nickel. We reach this one. Then we go on. At the next step, we trade in 2 nickels, and we acquire a dime, um, and so on. So. Uh, Next, we uh, trade in another pair of nickels. Then we're down here, where we have six dimes, a nickel, and two pennies. Then uh, we can, uh, what do we next? We trade uh, two dimes and a nickel for a quarter. And then finally, in the last step, we uh, trade in three dimes for a nickel in the quarter. And that's, at the end, we reach uh, two quarters, a dime, a nickel, and two pennies. So that's only six coins. In the beginning, we had uh, 15 coins in our pocket, 67 cents. In the end, we have only six pennies, which according to the criterion we wanted to optimize is a much better portfolio. 
So this is an example of an integer linear program. And as I said, uh, problems of this nature with uh, many more variables apply, uh, appear in many, many contexts in the business world. Airline flight, flight, screw, flight crew scheduling is a, a typical example where the number of coins would be, say, the cost that's associated to uh, having a certain uh, kind of arrangement. And you want to step-by-step uh, step optimize that to, uh, to pay less and achieve the same, achieving 67 cents. Just carrying this example one step further, um, let's suppose we travel to a different country um, that has coins just like the US, except that dimes are 11, worth 11 pennies. So we change, cross over to a different country where they also have uh, four coins, P, pennies, nickels, dimes, and quarters. But let's say the dimes are 11. So we might be in a slightly different situation where the values uh, of our various stocks in the portfolio changes. So what's the new Grobner basis? Well, now the Grobner basis uh, is listed here. The new Grobner basis consists of 11 transaction rules, one, two, three, and so on, these uh, 11 rules, and they're pretty complicated. So for instance, this one says you could trade in three pennies, a nickel, and a quarter, and get three dimes worth. That's a transaction rule of worth uh, 33. So the difficulty here lies in, in finding this uh, set called the Grobner basis. Um, I'd like to just make two comments. In this situation, in this different country, uh, one difference to the U.S. is that the optimal solution is no longer unique. So, for instance, if you have 27 cents in this country, then you could either do it with a nickel and two dimes, or with two pennies and a quarter, and both of them are optimal solutions. So, in this scenario, uh, the optimal solution is not unique. Uh, this has a lot to do with algebraic geometry, which was just mentioned, uh, where we would look at uh, the zeros of, of these equations, and I say no more about that. Okay, so this is an example of a Grobner basis. Let me uh, flash up an, an informal definition. <clears throat> a uh, a Grobner basis is a set of polynomials, a set of things like this, like the green expressions, that works as a directed rewriting system, a system of transformations that you can use, guaranteed working to use to successively improve things, any set of polynomials can be transformed into such a lucky set by uh, an algorithm called the Buchberger algorithm, and that's the one that generalizes the three well-known algorithms that I started out with. So let me uh, illustrate the, uh, the, the Grobner basis corresponding to the three examples that uh, we started out with. So in the first algorithm, in the we can simulate the Euclidean algorithm. So that means the input of the Grobner basis computation is the uh, there, and then the output would be x squared minus 1. Here's the second example, um, which is uh, identical to the, to the Gaussian elimination. If we input into our machine this input, out comes this solution. And in our nickels and dimes example, the way we specify the, uh, the currency in a given country would be simply to express the higher coins, to state the value of the higher coins. So this is the input, that's the output. And then in the funny country, this would be the input, and then we have 11 polynomials in, in the output. Okay, so in the remaining uh, maybe three or four minutes, let me say that the Grobner bases are a, a very active area of study at MSRI this semester. We heard this morning about what's going to happen in the, in the spring. So uh, this semester in the fall, um, Grobner bases are, are being studied a lot. And in particular, three weeks ago, there was a, a joint workshop between the, uh, the two programs that are currently in residence and it was called Solving Systems of Equations. Um, it was a big spectrum of things uh, ranging on the theory side, algebraic geometry and complexity towards uh, concrete applications in engineering and, and industry. 
and I'll pass around uh, a few printouts. We had one talk in particular, an invited talk on uh, systems of polynomial equations arising in industry. And this is a report uh, made for the European Union um, on this issue. So uh, they will explain a little bit, uh, just pass it out, some samples, the relevance of what I'm going to say in the next 15 seconds. Um, so in uh, solving systems of equations, we are given uh, nonlinear equations such as these two. So we'd like to find values of x and y such that if we plug them in to these two green polynomials, we got zero. Or uh, geometrically speaking, they would like to intersect a unit circle with a certain hyperbola. And in the Grotner basis approach, we transform the two given green equations into a Grotner basis. Uh, a nicer system of equations, which in this example uh, looks like this. And then from this nicer system of equations, there's a subsequent numerical calculation that uh, provides uh, floating point numbers, which is what the engineers and, and scientists like to see coming out for the green input. So my time is up. I'll just uh, throw on one more transparency. Uh, Kropner bases uh, appear everywhere. And I just uh, put on a few uh, samples of uh, topics that uh, researchers currently in residence at that MSRI are studying in the context of Grotner bases in, in lots of different settings. And I hope that uh, some of the participants of this workshop have opportunity to talk to some of the people at residence and, and in residence and, and find out more. Thank you very much. We'll be getting two more advances in math papers after the tea break, which is coming up in a moment. Um, and we can talk about the different ones in the group then. Uh, I'm realizing, though, one of the advantages of actually having the microphone and sharing these things, just to make one brief comment. I liked this particular lecture or, or talk because it gave concrete examples with real numbers and real things. And over and over again, when I read something mathematical, it goes right to the equations, or it goes right to the matrix with A11 and so on in it. And I personally find it, even as I get familiar with these things, easier to see the example, no matter how simple or trivial, but to see it in something real, in, in what I would call real terms first. And so I appreciated the little examples, which to a mathematician may not have meant anything at all, but it means a great deal to me. And it even came up, and AMS did put out some press releases. But I got stuck, because near the very beginning, there was no example with little numbers to show me how it really works. It takes me a lot longer to work through the algebra to find out what's there and so on. I can do it sometimes. You, more often, I don't have the time, so I have to phone someone up to tell me quickly what's going on, because we're on a very tight time pressure all the time. And so the little examples help tremendously. The little diagrams help tremendously. And so I put in a plug for those anywhere, any place. OK, we have time for tea in, I think, 30 minutes or cut it a bit? OK, 30 minutes. We'll be back here at 20 to 4. Is that right? <laughs>